It is so good to see your faces tonight. Thanks for joining us. My name is Mike. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Kairos Pastor, and it's a privilege to be a part of this community and to worship Jesus with you. If you've got a copy of the scriptures, why don't you turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. That's Exodus chapter 3. As you're turning there, I just got one quick announcement for you. Uh, we're kicking off something new at Kairos, something we've been thinking about for a little while and something I'm really excited about, and that is that we're going to be starting a podcast. And uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. You don't even know what it's about yet, but we're excited. Uh, and uh, we, we currently already do have uh, our sermons and our messages uh, in a podcast form for you to listen to every week. Uh, but we want to have a conversation through uh, podcasting. And so we're launching a podcast. We're calling it The Harder Question, which is a pun off my last name. Uh, <laughs> and uh, somebody clever came up with that. Uh, it wasn't me, I promise. Uh, but we're going to be having a conversation about faith and uh, the real world. So how does our faith interact with the real world? And we're going to be talking to different people about how their faith informs their their life. And so we're going to be uh, very excited to launch that in October. And our very first guest is actually going to be Boggs. So it's going to be me and Boggs talking about life and how uh, we live our life as people that love Jesus, as well as uh, people who just live ordinary lives in the real world. But there's going to be a bunch of other people we're going to be interviewing as we um, do this podcast. Now, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is really simple. We want to hear from you, okay? So we don't want this to just be us talking to uh, nameless, faceless people out there. We want this to be something that, that pours into you. And so one of the things we want to offer is we want to hear questions that you may have. There's going to be a part of the podcast that's going to be life advice questions where you can ask anything that you want uh, to have answered. And so uh, feel free to make those as real and as raw as you want. We'll keep anything confidential uh, that you might want to keep confidential. We won't even say your name if you don't want us to. Uh, but we'll have a list of questions we'll be answering. So the easiest way, if you have a question, whether it's about theology or your dating life or how you follow Jesus in real time, just send those to uh, either my Instagram account, Pastor Mike Carter, or info at kairosnashville.com. And anything you want, keep confidential, we will. But we just think this is a really great way for us to have a dialogue and kind of tackle some of the things that you're already thinking about. So uh, stay tuned for that. So between now and in October, uh, we'd love to hear those from you. We'll, we'll address a couple of those questions every, every show. So that should be pretty fun. Um, now, if you've got a copy of the Bibles, you're there in Exodus. We're going to be talking today about God's holiness. God's holiness. And one of the things that's been interesting to me as we've been walking through this uh, series, God Is, is that it's been challenging to keep the focus on God. I don't know about you, but a lot of times when we read the Bible or I read the Bible, I'll sometimes read something about God and then immediately try to figure out how that fits in with my life. Pastors do this too, where we'll talk about God and then immediately try to like make your life fit into that. And there's a good part of that, but then there's also a part that's not as helpful because we can easily make following Jesus about us. And sometimes we can make even preaching about us. Sometimes we can make preaching a series of life hacks, right? We're like, man, if I do these things, then God's going to make my life great. And I can leverage God and what he tells me about life in the Bible to have the, the perfect life here and now, right? So if I, if I read the Bible and I do the things that it says, I'm going to have the perfect spouse or I'm going to have perfect, well-behaved children, which, by the way, there are no such thing, okay? Just as a dad of three, like they're always... Uh, a mix. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're absolutely a dumpster fire. Okay. Just to be honest. Okay. Sometimes you're like, man, I'm so proud of these kids. And other times you're like, whose children are those? Like, I have no idea who that child is. Right. But at the same time, uh, it's important for us. And when we're looking at a, a series like this is to keep the focus on God. And then from our understanding of who God reveals himself to be, then uh, start looking at who we're supposed to be in light of that incredible God. And so today we're talking about God's holiness. We're going to go back to the beginning, to the very first time that the word holy was used in the Bible. And it's in Moses' story, which I think is so interesting because when Moses meets God, he hears from God that God is holy. And up to that point, no one knew that God was holy until God said that. 
So let's look at the text together and see what God is revealing about himself in Exodus chapter 3. So I'm going to read the story to you. It says this in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Meanwhile Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come any closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses was a, hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, some of you who've been coming to Kairos for a while, that, that passage might sound very familiar to you. Uh, and it's because I've already taught it, okay? I, all week when I was like prepping, I was like, this sounds really familiar. Like, I feel like I preached this recently, you know? And I kept on looking back through my files and I couldn't find them. So finally I opened up my Bible because I was looking on my computer as I was prepping. I was like, oh, I, I preached this message the first Sunday I was at Kairos. So there's that, okay? And, uh, and at the same time, I felt God clearly calling me to teach this text because I think that there's something he wants us to see in it. So we're going to be looking at the story of Moses and the burning bush, but we're going to be looking at it in a different way, in a different perspective than what we did last time. Last time we looked primarily uh, at worship through this story. Like how do we worship? God wants to create worshipers. But tonight I want to talk about holiness. I want to talk about how God reveals himself to be holy. And that's the first thing we see here. We see that God reveals himself to be holy. He reveals that he's holy. Now, for many of us, we don't understand what the word holiness is. Like we think about holiness as basically uh, goodness. So we like equate the two. We think holiness, and we think that holiness means goodness. And we couldn't be farther from the truth. Holiness does not necessarily mean goodness. And I know that a lot of us, we think somebody's holy, like, oh, you're so holy. That's what we say when we think somebody's like being really good, right? But the idea of holiness is far deeper and more profound and it carries with it a lot more weight than simply being good. Here you find Moses coming uh, up upon a bush that's been burning. And the reason he's there in the middle of the wilderness is because God had done something incredible in Moses' life. Even though Moses was born as a slave, God placed him in Pharaoh's household underneath the protection of the princess of Egypt. She adopted him. And he grew up with all the rights and privileges of any other Egyptian prince. And one day he realized that he wasn't like everybody else. He was like, one of us is not like the others. I'm, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm a Hebrew. And he decides that he wants to liberate his people. And in the process of doing that, he kills an Egyptian that was beating a Hebrew. And as a result, he runs for his life because he knows that Pharaoh's wrath is going to come upon him. And he runs from everybody and everything that he knew and leaves Egypt and goes out into the middle of nowhere, into the wilderness of Sinai. And for 40 years... He only takes care of sheep. He trades the riches of a prince for the rags of a shepherd. And in the middle of this absolute broken story, God calls him to a great work, which is to free his people. But the thing that we find here is that Moses, he's walking through the, the wilderness. He first sees a bush that's burning and then he comes and investigates it. And God calls him to come closer. And when he does, he is told this. I want you guys to look at the text with me, okay. This is really important stuff right here. In verse 4, 
It says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. God tells Moses, hey, listen, I want you to come closer, but at some point you're going to need to stop and take your shoes off because the place you're standing on is holy ground. And Moses does so, and then God tells him that God is the God of his ancestors, and Moses covers his face because he's afraid of the presence of God. And here we find something about God that no one really knew up to this point, is that God is holy. Now, this word holiness, I mentioned it's not something that we, we can just um, equate to goodness. Holiness means two things. First uh, part of holiness means being set apart. For the glory of God. So it's not just being set apart just simply because it's set apart for a specific purpose. But God is holy in that he's set apart. He's different and he's set apart for the purpose of his own glory. That he's different than everybody else around him. He is special. He is unique. And he's been set apart for a purpose. That God's ultimate goal and his ultimate plan is to be glorified above all things and all people and every created object and every created being. That he alone is worthy of worship. That's what it means that God is holy. That he is set apart for the glory of God. That he's been set apart for the worship of God. The second part of God's holiness is that he has a perfect moral character. Which means... That because God is exalted above everybody else, because he's been set apart, he cannot do any sinful action. He's completely pure in everything that he does. That's the second part of his holiness. Now, when you think about holiness, when you think about God being set apart for his glory, and when you think about God being completely right and good in everything he does, that sounds really intimidating, doesn't it? Man, it makes us sometimes immediately think about the worst thing that we've ever done. Or about all the worst things that we've done, right? Let's be honest, we've, we've done some stuff we're, we're not necessarily proud of. And so sometimes we can think immediately about how bad we are when we think about how good God is. And that's what Moses does. That's why the Bible tells us that Moses hid his face. Because he knows that he doesn't add up to what God's all about. He knows he's not good enough. But here's something I want you to see about God's holiness that's really, really important and that drives us closer to God. See, sometimes we think about holiness and we think, man, holiness means I can't come close. I've got to run away. I feel exposed. But there's something incredibly powerful about God's holiness in that God's holiness is what gives us the, the ability to trust him. God's holiness is the reason why God is trustworthy. Jackie Hill Perry says this. If God is holy, then he can't sin. If God can't sin, then he can't sin against you. If he can't sin against you, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being there is? Isn't that good? If God can't sin against you, because by his very nature he's holy and he is upright, then doesn't that mean that you can trust him? That he's going to do the right thing every time. God is holy. He's set apart. But here's the crazy part about God's holiness. Is that God calls us to be holy just like him. God invites you to be holy. And God invites me to be holy. God wants us to be set apart for his glory. And we see that in this story with Moses. God is inviting Moses into holiness. He's not pushing him away saying, you don't measure up. You're not good enough. You did some bad stuff. You murdered some people. You're, you're horrible, Moses. You should run from me. God instead pursues Moses. 
We see it through several things in this story. First of all, is the bush itself, right? Like God wants to be found and he creates a beacon, literally, of fire so that Moses will see him and come close to God. God sets up a burning bush so that Moses will be curious. Sometimes God does that in your story. He may make something happen in your life so that you will be curious about what he's doing and who he is. And so that you'll go investigate. And Moses turns and he looks and the first thing that he hears is what? He hears his name. He hears his name. God says, Moses. So check this out. Moses has spent 40 years in the middle of nowhere. Sinai, where he's at, is basically a bunch of rocks and bushes. That's it. There's nothing else. In fact, the reason why God used a burning bush, because the only other choice he had was a rock. Okay, there's nothing out there to set on fire. Like, there's nothing. And for 40 years, Moses is like, listen, God, you gave me all these skills and you gave me all this uh, like information as a, as a leader and you trained me up to be a prince of Egypt and I'm stuck out here in the middle of nowhere watching a bunch of smelly sheep. You obviously don't care and you don't know who I am. And the first thing that God says is Moses' name and in it God says, I know who you are. I'm saying, come here, and I'm calling you by name. doesn't matter what kind of wilderness experience you're going through. God knows who you are and where you are, and he knows you by name. But he doesn't just say Moses' name once. Like, Moses, come over here, like I do with my dog. I'm like, Ivy, get over here, right? You know what he says to Moses? He says his name twice. And in the Bible, when someone says someone's name twice, it's a term of endearment. It's a father calling a beloved son. And God says, Moses, Moses. It's an invitation to come close. Just like the fire was an invitation for him to have curiosity, God says Moses' name twice to draw him near because God wants to have a relationship with Moses. And the third thing I want you to see here is that God doesn't outsource this calling and this relationship with Moses. Look with me. In verse 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. The angel of the Lord, when it's all in caps, is always a form of deity. It's usually either a form of God the Father or it's Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, revealing himself to people. And here you find God sending himself to call Moses into a place of holiness, to be set apart. That's why he invites him to take his shoes off because the place he's standing is holy ground. Because see, what God is going to do, when he calls Moses out to go bring the people out of Egypt, he has a plan where he doesn't just want to do something in Moses, but he wants to do this in every single one of his people. He wants to set apart for himself a people for his own possession. And he wants them to be holy. Check this out in Leviticus verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 45. God says this to his people. He says, For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, so you must be holy because I am holy. So God says, because I'm your God and I brought you up out of Egypt, I want you to be holy just like me. I want you to, to have the same kind of character and personal holiness that I have. I want you to be set apart for a purpose. I want you to be a people that will glorify me with your lives. Now, I know that when we hear that, it can be so intimidating because we're like, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Right? I don't know if I... How, I mean, I can, I'm just, you're just lucky I walked in the church. In fact, I'm just glad that when I walked in here, the roof didn't cave in on me, okay? Like, and some of you are here and you're like, man, I, I haven't been in church in years and I'm, I'm feeling pretty broken, I'm feeling pretty vulnerable. You're talking about holiness. I don't know if, I, if I'm cut out for this. Like, I feel exposed. And I just want you to hear this tonight. If that's you, just know you're in really good company. You're in really good company. 
You know, the path towards holiness always meets us in the place where we are most broken. Moses' life was is the place where he was the most broken. And God was closest to him in the middle of his brokenness. And doesn't matter how messed up you are, God's posture is always one of welcoming broken people. I know this from experience. So when I was in college, I had a season where I ran away from God. And I ran away from God pretty hard because I grew up in a, in a, uh, in a church. My, my dad was the pastor. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the term the fishbowl effect. But basically it means that um, you feel like your whole life is in a fishbowl and everybody's kind of looking in at you and be like, hey, perform, you know. <laughs> and for me, I, I experienced that because my dad was not just a pastor. He was kind of like the, the, the pastor that started the entire mission work in the area that we were living in. So they called my dad El Gran Jefe, which means the big chief in Colombia, okay. And so um, they, they all expected me and my, my brothers and sisters to act like we were perfect. In fact, that's the way I, I felt. And I... I, I was just like a normal kid, just like anybody else. I made my Sunday school teachers cry too, okay. I, I, I was a rebel at heart in a lot of ways. And when I went to college, I didn't know if I really wanted to follow God. And I didn't know if I wanted to, 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 to give my life to God. I, I kind of wanted to do my own thing. And I kind of wanted to figure out what life was like without uh, being known as the pastor's kid. So I just kind of found some friends that we ran after the world pretty hard. And every once in a while I go to church. I remember waking up one morning going, man, I'm kind of de-churched. I haven't been in church in like four or five months. So I should go to church. So I got up, I didn't shave, I got up and I went to church. And I went to the church I was going to, which was Bethlehem Baptist in uh, Minneapolis. Um, John Piper was the pastor there before he was even famous, before he went to one day, before anybody knew who he was. He was the pastor of the small church in downtown Minneapolis. I remember going there and uh, sitting in the balcony and just listening to him preach, and because I'm a smart aleck, I was like, oh, he used that r- word wrong in Greek. So I was like, write that down. And I decided I was going to go down to the front and correct John Piper. So I was like, okay, I'm ready to go. I haven't been in church in months, but man, this is me. I'm going to go up front. And so I went down front afterwards, and he was standing there. And um, I was like, hey, you said this word wrong. And he goes, okay, it's cool. I mean, literally, John Piper, living legend, okay, like written more books about God than almost anybody ever. And uh, I was like, you got this part wrong. And he was just so kind to me. And all he did was he said, can I pray for you? <laughs> I was like, sure. And so he prayed for me. And, and, then just, and then just like, just, just, just kind of lovingly just kind of said, all right, I'll see you next week. And I'll never forget that moment. You know why? Not because it was John Piper. It was simply because I was coming from a place of being so broken and far from the Lord. And when I came close I found only grace. And I found a posture of just receiving. And I remember what it feels like to feel like you're in the wilderness. What I found is that just like I felt in that moment um, where God just gave me a picture into what grace and just mercy and just even... Even uh, his patience with really proud young people, you know how it feels like. God wants to do the same thing with all of us. You know, when we think about God's holiness, it's not a standard that we can do on our own. If we think theologically about holiness, the reason why things are holy is not because of the effort of people. It's because of God's presence. So Moses, when he comes to God and God says, take your shoes off because the place you're standing is holy ground. It's not because the ground was special. God didn't choose that bush because he was like, all right, what's the most special uh, bush in the entire uh, uh, Sinai Peninsula? And I'm going to go there because that's going to be the place where everything is going to happen. No, the only reason that bush was special is because God said it was. And the only reason the ground that Moses was standing on was holy is because God's presence was there. And the only reason why Moses would end up becoming someone who is holy is because God said, I'm going to use you. And the only reason God chose the people of Israel was not because they were great. Because the Bible tells us that they made a lot of mistakes and they constantly were turning to idols. 
but because he said, I want these people to be my people. And I'm going to elevate my name through them. And what that means for us is that when we think about being holy, the only way we can be holy is if God declares it to be true in our life and the presence of God enters into our life and into our story and that the Holy Spirit would take up residence within us. It's the only way we can become holy. It's not because we try harder, but because God simply chooses to live within us and he declares us to be his. Let that sink in for just a minute. Some of us have been trying to prove to God that we're good enough and we'll never get there. The only way we can be holy like God is holy is if he comes and lives within us. That's it. So how do we get there? How do we get to be in a place where we can become holy like God? And the way we get there is simply by approaching the burning bush that God has placed in front of us. We respond to the burning bush. Moses sees the bush, turns aside and approaches it. And when God calls him to take his sandals off, he does so. He responds to what God is doing. And he sets himself apart for God's work. I've been asking myself the question all week. I'm like, so how long was the bush burning before Moses actually noticed it? Have you ever wondered that? Like, <clears throat> seriously, like, the story reads like, oh, Moses is just walking along. He's like, oh, there's a bush, and I'm just going to check it out. But, like, I wonder if that bush had been burning for weeks, right, or months, where Moses walks, walks by. He's like, oh, there's a bush. Cool, it's on fire, and keeps walking. Then he walks back a couple weeks later. He's like, that bush is, that bush is still going. That's interesting, and then continues doing what he's doing. And then like three weeks later, he's like, it's still on fire. I should go check that out. So finally he walks over. He's like, what's going on with the bush, right? I can't help but wonder if some of us are going through the same thing. where we, We've been asking God to show up and we've been in the middle of a wilderness and we're wondering what God is doing. And all around us there are burning bushes and we're not stopping to check out what God is doing. We're not stopping and saying, God, I want to see what you're doing. And so tonight, my invitation to you is to stop and to approach God because he's holy and he wants to do something in you. He wants to change who you are and he wants to take up residence within you. And he wants to change you and make you his own. And the way you get there is simply by saying, I want to be set apart. That's what holiness means, right? I want to be a set apart for God's glory. I want to be someone who belongs to God. I want to be someone who belongs to God. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to simply say, I want to be someone who's set apart for God's purposes. And to be honest, like a lot of us want to be different, right? We want to be noticed. We want to have our life count. We want to be unique. It's really hard in Nashville to be unique, right? One of the things I love about like Nashville is that people move here and they're like the most unique, most artsy person in their town. And then they show up and there's like a million people just like them, right? <laughs> like, man, wait, I, was, I was the one who's on trend. I came here and everybody's like this. But what I know about the human heart is that even though we may say what we really want is to be unique or to be different, what we really want is we want to be loved and we want to have a purpose. And the way that you get there is by saying, I want to give my life all of it. I want to be set apart for God and his glory. That's how you get there. Because everything else will fade. But being set apart means that you're going to be different. And you're not going to live the same life that everybody else is living. You will look different and you will have a different story. And that may mean you have to make some hard decisions. If you say, I want to be set apart, I want to be holy, it may mean that you're going to have to live differently than the people you're running with right now. 
It may mean that you're going to have to live differently than some of your roommates or some of your friends. It may mean that you're going to have to make some choices to live a different lifestyle than the one that you're currently living. Because if you are set apart for God's glory, it means that you no longer get to call the shots. You do what God tells you to do. And I remember doing that. When I was in college, I told you, like, I was like running away from the Lord, found some friends that were doing that. The most significant moment in my collegiate experience, other than the moment that I said I'm going to give my life to Jesus, was the moment I actually started saying I'm going to take action on that decision. And I decided to get all new friends. And I said I want to live on fire for Jesus Christ. But the, the greatest obstacle to that is the people that I'm living with. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find a different set of roommates because the ones I'm living with right now keep dragging me away from holiness and I want to follow Jesus. And so I did. Best decision I ever made. For some of us, that's the decision God's calling us to tonight. To make a radical step of saying, I want to follow God and I'm going to take away anything that will keep me from doing that. Well, that means I'm going to plug into a life group where I can find different friends that will help me love Jesus here at Cairo. So I'm going to, I'm going to choose to, to be in relationship with other people that love the Lord like I want to love the Lord. Or I'm going to make sure that I go to Cairo every Sunday night. I'm not just going to go once a month or when the weather is right. But I'm going to make sure that I'm plugged in. Being someone who is God's is a life-changing decision. It's saying, I'm set apart for God and His glory. So as we close, I just want to give us an invitation to respond. We're going to have a time of response through music. But as we transition to doing that, I just want to ask you two questions, okay? Just to ponder. First, are you looking for the burning bush? Are you looking for what God is doing? Are you even, is your radar up at all? If it isn't, my invitation to you is just to look around and see what God is doing. Say, God, where are you in the middle of the stuff that I'm involved with? God, are you really being glorified through my life? God, are you out there? So just take a moment as we're singing over you and as we're leading worship, just to think like, okay, how am I doing? Am I really seeing what God is doing and am I joining him? And the second question I want you to, to consider is this. What does it look like for me to be set apart? What does it look like for me, the situation I'm in right now, to be set apart for God's glory? What does it look like? Is there anything I need to change to be like that? Are there patterns that I need to break? Are there new friends I need to pursue? And doing this kind of work is important because God is ultimately worth it. He is worth it. More than we can imagine, God is worth it. And the fruit of us seeing the bush, turning and approaching God will change our life forever forever. So will we have the courage to turn and look and approach God's voice and say, I'm right here, God. Do whatever you want with my life. Jesus, as we close tonight, would your spirit invade this place would Jesus, Holy Spirit, would, would this not just be words that we're talking about, but actually power and life transformation right now in this room? Right now there's a young man wondering if he can really trust you because his dad was such a bad dad. Right now there's a young woman in this room is feeling really, really alone and tired. Right now there's a single parent who's, 
I'm just feeling the weight of the loneliness right now. The burden of raising this child, to love that child, but it's hard right now. Right now, there's a young couple who's trying to figure out marriage, and they just feel like they can't seem to get it right. But God, right now, you are closer than we can imagine. You're calling us to be holy, to set ourselves apart for you. I pray that we'd have the courage to say yes. It's in your name we pray, amen.